thanks for coming back from the break. I'm excited to have you back here. We have been on a tour de force of wireless and it doesn't stop now. We're gonna go on to our next presenter, which is Scott Imhoff. who's the SVP of product management and planning at Cambian Networks. Uh, he's been there since the beginning. He's seen a lot of change in the industry. Uh, we've been talking about all the different wireless technologies and thinking about that portfolio, as I mentioned in my opening remarks. And uh, Scott is going to come to us today and talk about the time has come for 6 gigahertz and Wi-Fi 6E and talk a little bit about some of the differences and the similarities in, in that statement when he says that and what it means for you and what the standards community means for you and what you should be thinking about right now and how you should be building a path forward. So uh, with that, let's turn it over to Scott's comments. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It is a pleasure to be with you here today. This is an unusual experience and an unusual opportunity for Cambium Networks that perhaps is a positive benefit of COVID. It'd be virtually impossible for us to get together with our end users around the world at one time, uh, other than doing it virtually. So we're gonna make the best of the situation and bring you some tremendous information today my particular session on six gigahertz is relevant to our global audience and i'm looking forward to sharing some of this information with you today so with that said let's jump into it and i want to start with perhaps some clarification and you will hear uh, myself i suspect and others use six gigahertz and six e synonymously and to a degree they are synonymous uh, but to a degree they're not so six gigahertz is just that. It's the RF band that is being opened up around the world. Uh, and six E is the specific implementation of that six gigahertz for Wi-Fi. Uh, the E incidentally stands for extended. So six gigahertz and six E uh, are, are in some cases synonymous, uh, but, but think of them uh, independently, particularly when you're contemplating fixed wireless broadband and six gigahertz. So I like to always start with who cares? Why are we doing this? So first of all, it's up to 1200 megahertz of clean unlicensed spectrum. I think unlicensed is the key word there in terms of investment in spectrum and, and access. The, the regulatory bodies are endeavoring for thoughtful allocation for both indoor and outdoor use. So going back to the comment on 6E for prim primarily indoor, but not exclusively, and fixed wireless broadband for outdoor applications. Wi-Fi 6E does exclude backwards compatibility with A, N, and AC. And you might say, wow, that's challenging. But in reality, it's a good thing. Is it, it cleans up uh, the less efficient standards uh, that, that come before 6E and make for the most efficient use of that new spectrum. We can support up to 160 megahertz channels. And that translates to significantly higher data rates. Lower latency. Historically, Wi-Fi has not been the best uh, transport for uh, internet, industrial internet of things, IIoT. It's certainly uh, viable for, for consumer and home uh, type of, of networking, but the latency really prohibited it from machine to machine. And 6C addresses that. And it includes uh, the need in the case of the FCC and, and other markets around the world, the use of an automatic frequency coordination service to protect the incumbent users of licensed microwave. So what I just kind of went through is some high level summaries of speeds and feeds. Uh, and, and from a product standpoint, those are important and they're, they're enablers. But the really who cares is you and why you care is what you're going to be able to do with this six gigahertz spectrum to be able to better open up the digital home for pleasure, for work, for study, uh, for control and management. The advancement of AR and VR, again, for work, study and play is advancing quickly, but it requires significant bandwidth to be effective. Advanced surveillance systems around the world, growing and extending. The digital classroom, whether it's in the classroom or remote or hybrid, ever greater use of technology in the learning process. In the fixed wireless broadband space, being able to deliver gigabit to the edge. 
machine to machine for industry 4.0, many, many more applications are gonna be enabled by the use of that up to 1200 megahertz of spectrum. And that's why we care. So let's touch a little bit on the status around the world, starting with Etsy. Nice progress. Uh, there is a what's referred to as a stable draft, and it will likely be finalized in the official journal in March of 2022. Further, the six gigahertz spectrum itself will likely be harmonized across the EU. And that's fantastic because it makes for a common platform, common uh, interoperability, uh, makes it easier for manufacturers to develop product, but more importantly, makes it uh, significantly easier for end users to have a reliable solution. Now, the downside to Etsy is at present, the very low power makes it almost economically unviable for outdoor use. And I've highlighted that in red above and provided some comparisons to 5.4 and 5.8 bands, and you can see why that is. So hopefully some movement on that in the future, but at present, uh, it would seem that six gigahertz is going to be optimized for indoor use only in Etsy governed markets. On the FCC front, 1200 megahertz of low power indoor, phenomenal. 850 megahertz of outdoor with the use of automatic frequency coordination. The, the standard itself is well underway. Uh, there are some elements uh, formally called a further notice of proposed rulemaking that are underway. And that those are progressing. There's been some recent publications from the FCC on those. So those will be worked out, I'd say, in the coming months. Uh, there is a legal petition to set aside uh, the report and order, meaning uh, do away with the use of six gigahertz. And I'll, I'll touch on that in just a moment. So that's a, a bit of a hurdle in front of us. On that front, the petition uh, was initially uh, requested an emergency stay uh, that emergency stay was denied, and now they've moved forward in, a, in the more detailed uh, legal review of the request uh, to set aside. And the basis of that was that the FCC lacked a reason basis themselves, that they had not done sufficient analysis or study of the impact of opening up six gigahertz, particularly on the incumbent users themselves. And you can see there on the right-hand side, uh, the petitioners are, are significant, they're meaningful. These are folks that rely on six gigahertz uh, licensed microwave for their wide area networking needs. And they carry crucial information on those paths. And, and, and certainly it's important to them to ensure that they're not going to be interfered with and they can continue to rely on those licensed microwave networks. Uh, the courts have put forward a fairly specific set of milestones and dates associated with it. They've begun to check the boxes on those dates, and uh, Cambium's view is that we'll see a, a decision, a formal decision, uh, in the October 21 timeframe. But it is progressing, and, and I think the industry would agree that it would likely be um, addressed in a, in a timely fashion, and you would expect six gigahertz to progress. On the automatic frequency coordination front, uh, this is not a, a new concept per se for the FCC. I think they set, the, set a reference point with CBRS, Citizens Broadband Radio Service, and SAS services uh, as a viable approach. So uh, AFC is called out in the report and order. It's required for outdoor use and more specifically the high power outdoor use. And, and AFC is intended to protect uh, the licensed microwave users, the petitioners that I referenced in the prior slide. So it is intended to protect those incumbent users. It is not intended to coordinate new users, unlike CBRS, which does just that. So users of the six gig spectrum uh, with uh, AFC in place will still deal with prospective interference from other uh, non-licensed microwave users. And you can expect multiple AFCs to be approved and in operation in any geographic area. Uh, and, and the manufacturers and network operators will likely interact with multiple AFCs themselves. The report and order that the FCC put in place identified a multi-stakeholder group uh, to work through the details of the, I'll say the boundary conditions that the FCC put in place. Uh, that uh, MSG is being led by the Wireless Innovation Forum and the Wi-Fi Alliance, 
and Cambium is a active participant in those working groups. Outside of Etsy and the FCC, uh, access to six gigahertz is opening up around the world. Uh, notable progress in the UK and South Korea and Brazil, the United Arab Emirates. And I suspect that this list is short. Uh, I suspect that there are other locales around the world that are actively opening up six gigahertz and you'll see that accelerate in, in the coming months. But it is underway and encourage you to take a look at your local regulatory environment to see what, what the state of play is. Uh, beyond the regulatory front, we are seeing the broader ecosystem uh, react to six gigahertz and 6E. Uh, certainly client devices are advancing. We're seeing sensor manufacturers and instrumentation uh, manufacturers with the lower latency for Wi-Fi uh, reacting favorably uh, to six gigahertz. Network design tools, including those from Cambium, are coming online. Uh, as with uh, any new RF band, the test and measurement tools need to be updated and upgraded and made, made available, and that's taking place. The development is, is underway on the AFCs. I've seen uh, some demonstrated already. And as you can see on the left-hand side, the industry groups are ramping the training and certification processes to make good use of this newfound wealth in spectrum. Now, there's also a question of, well, when is it going to be useful spectrum outside of the regulatory, uh, outside of products coming online, when are we actually going to be able to use the six gigahertz spectrum in the sense of client access? So a couple of data points to keep in mind. Uh, your mobile phone in today's society really sets the stage for utilization. And in the US, and I suspect that this is mimicked around the world, the average upgrade cycle right now is about three years, meaning uh, the typical mobile phone user upgrades their phone about every three years. Uh, a similar study uh, undertaken by Ting Mobile indicates that about 50% of the people uh, on their network upgrade their phone in a three to five year time frame. So two, two data points kind of in that three year time frame. Now, this last holiday season, which tends to be a, a, a peak time period uh, that phones are upgraded as gifts and, and other reasons, uh, four of the really primary high profile phones uh, in the holiday season are listed there on the left hand side. All four of those phones are 802.11ax, that's good but they were dual band two, four, five gigahertz. They did not include six gigahertz. The first six gigahertz phone was actually just announced on January 14th and available. Again, I'm in the US, Chicago, Verizon has this phone now available. So January 14th, it became available and it's tri-band two, four, five and six gig. Uh, the kicker though, the retail price is $1,200. So this is not the everyman phone. Uh, we do not expect uh, a common phone to support six gigahertz until the fall of 21. Laptop vendors are also progressing. Uh, a good example is uh, Intel's AX210 uh, platform, and they're expecting that to be available mid-2021. And you would expect a, a similar approach initially available on their higher tier uh, laptops and tablets. Put that together and what that suggests is, is we won't have critical mass penetration, in our opinion, until Q2 2023. What that means is, uh, if you think about the cycle on, on rotation of phones and, and clients like laptops and tablets that can make use of six gigahertz, there's really not gonna be a preponderance of clients using six gigahertz until Q2 2023. So you've got time. Now, you may have older Wi-Fi networks deployed within your enterprise and your business today. So what do you do? Do you wait? Well, no, you don't wait. But there's an enormous population of two, four, and five gigahertz clients that are going to persist for a long time and can take advantage of Wi-Fi 6. And you can lift the performance of your network significantly independent of six gigahertz. But what you want to think about in making those investments in a six gigahertz platform, even though it's not going to be used significantly until that 2023 timeframe, is how you handle that transition. 
So you can think about on the, uh, if you look at this slide, if you're making an investment in six gigahertz, six E in the 2020 timeframe, do you have a software defined AP? Do you have a tri-band uh, uh, AP, Wi-Fi AP? Because near term, two, four and five gig are gonna be the dominant bands and you wanna be able to allocate the computational horsepower and RF horsepower of that AP to take advantage of two, four and five gig. But at the same time, as the client population of 6E devices ramps, you want to be able to start to allocate capacity on that AP to 6E. Can you do that? That's really the operative question. So I'm going to kind of go through a little bit of a recap here. Uh, six gig regulatory approval. Check your local regulatory position. Understand the distinction between indoor and outdoor. Are you deploying fixed wireless broadband at six gigahertz? Or are you most interested in indoor 6E? Etsy and FCC are great reference points. Uh, many regulatory bodies around the world refer back to Etsy and FCC, but they do not necessarily dictate the local requirements. Pay attention to what's going on locally. Uh, reach out to your KMBM representative and we can help you navigate through that or, or show what information we have available at that time. On the device front, mobile phones are going to set the pace. Uh, that's the reality of today's society. Laptops and tablets will trail. Uh, and really what you want to ideally uh, align to is the tipping point on device penetration. On the Wi-Fi access standpoint, tri-band is absolutely the way to go. Uh, two, four and five gig will have a long tail from a five gig standpoint, probably infinite tail, uh, but it's a tri-band AP is the key. You want that unit to be software defined. You want to be able to optimize the computational horsepower and the RF to the, the density of devices, whether it's two, four, five, or uh, in 2023 forward, six gigahertz. And of course, uh, Wi-Fi 6C certification is, is crucial. Uh, don't invest in an AP that isn't certified. That'll protect you and your customers. So really what you want to do is a line on the intersection of these three core elements, regulatory approval, software defined radio, and device population. Having said that, there's no need to postpone network upgrades. If you're contemplating an upgrade to Wi-Fi 6, proceed forward. You are gonna have five plus good years of performance given the density of devices that are out there using five gigahertz today. If you are making that investment and you're contemplating the use of six gigahertz, ensure that that radio is tri-band, ensure that it supports software-defined uh, radios, and, and that'll give you uh, maximum flexibility and agility in managing your network. From a Cambium standpoint, uh, we are tracking right along with six gigahertz. Uh, our first six E radios for Wi-Fi will come online in the second half of 2021. Uh, they will be tri-band, they are software defined, they'll provide you that investment protection. On the fixed wireless broadband side, both our ePMP platform and PMP 450 platform will support six gigahertz. Uh, different approaches and different considerations are probably best discussed with your uh, Cambium representative, but on the ePMP front, uh, 496 QAM, 160 meg channels, the ability to support gigabit to the edge uh, inherent. On the 450 uh, PMP 450 uh, platform, you'll see us uh, support dual band, two carrier aggregation, path to fixed 5G, very, very important. So in closing, I think we all know this saying, all good things take time. Cambia's first touch point on six gigahertz was April 23rd of 2017. I had to go back a long way in my email records to find that touch point. For those of you that are doing the quick math, that's 1,400 days ago from today that we began this journey. And that's not atypical of investment in technology, uh, particularly when regulatory changes are necessary. But patience leads to good things. And the time has come for 6 gigahertz and Wi-Fi 6E. Thank you. Hey, we are back with Scott. Scott, thank you for that great presentation. I thought it was very enlightening and what some of the differences were, uh, what some of the opportunities are moving forward. And you gave a really uh, 
good, like, here's what we need to think about now, and here's when we think things are going to happen. Um, I would like to remind everybody in the audience that we are going to be taking live q and I've seen some come in, but please make sure that you submit your questions down below. I also want to tee up that at the end, all of the executives are going to be coming back. So if there was a question you didn't get answered in any of the previous sessions, uh, keep that in the back of your mind because we will be doing an executive Q&A wrap up at the end. Um, but right now, I would like to push a poll. Um, so the poll that we're going to talk about right now is how significant is six gigahertz spectrum to your business plan? So if we could push that poll. And while we are actually pushing that poll, I'm going to go over to some of the Q&A that we have been uh, seeing in the chat window. Um, first, I think I might um, do a little bit of a uh, clarification, and that's you were talking about, you know, um, having tri-band radios and software-defined uh, APs. Um, if they, if an organization has that, is there anything else that they should be doing to prepare for this new 6E future? Or are you pretty good with that? I, I think that that uh, that probably is the key attribute or consideration to keep in mind. Uh, as we progress closer to the deployment of six gig based solutions in, in, in if you're in a uh, in indoor environment in particular, one thing that you might think about doing is uh, a new survey of your floor plan with respect to six gigahertz. It will have slightly different propagation characteristics. So if you did a propagation study with with five gig or certainly two two four some time ago in the past, that might be something worth investing in is a, a full uh, propagation study using six gigahertz to really understand what your coverage is going to look like uh, as you deploy th that band. But other than that, uh, I, I think uh, your earlier comments were spot on. Okay, that makes perfect sense because really, um, you know, for many organizations, that propagation study is the thing that gives them a sense of um, how well or difficult it is going to be to have certain types of applications. And we're talking about changes in the application landscape as well in terms of uh, what those applications require in terms of bandwidth, in terms of latency, uh, in terms of device density. So I think it's a really good time to think about that. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, one of the other things I wanted to ask you as we were going through uh, your presentation, I was thinking about it, is it, it sounds like you mentioned that, you know, 6E is a fairly radical departure from previous versions. Um, how has that changed what you as Cambian Networks need to think about what you're trying to develop? Were there any changes that you thought of architecturally? Well, yeah, what, what I was referring to in that context was not carrying forward the past standards. Mm -hmm. uh, and. I don't know, good or bad, it doesn't really change significantly our development approach because we're going to support from a software defined radio standpoint, those older standards within the radio itself or that they, so that they can be used by our customers up until the point that they wanna really enable those six gig radios. So we're still gonna develop against it. We're, we're gonna include it, not, not on the six gigahertz, but on the, the two, four and the five, we'll, we'll go through our system integration and test, et cetera. Isolating it to six gig, it will, I would think, accelerate our development a bit because we won't have as many uh, test cases to go back and test against uh, from a, a system integration and test perspective. So it makes it a little bit easier in that regard. But outside of that, no, no, no significant changes. Okay, that makes sense. I'm going to give folks another minute to answer the poll. So if you haven't answered the poll questions, please do so. Uh, but while we're doing that, a question came in. I think there was a typo in it, um, but it will. So I'm going to read it the way I think it should be read. Will the six gigahertz spectrum uh, being opened up be evolutionary or revolutionary? That's a great question. And, and it's, uh, you know, you'd like to say both uh, in, in some respects. Yeah. I suspect what will happen over time is just the proliferation of devices and the capacity demands are, are going to be there. And, and in that respect, it's it's really just uh, evolutionary use of the Wi-Fi standard and available spectrum uh, uh, in fixed wireless broadband uh, to, to meet the needs of, of the population and businesses. But from a revolutionary standpoint, the, the fact that it's up to 1200 megahertz, and I read a report today that Canada may be even looking at, at more spectrum than that, it, it really changes the, 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 uh, the, the playing field 
for operators. And the fact that it's unlicensed spectrum and doesn't carry the cost of spectrum, I think you'll start to see some pretty innovative uses of, of six gigahertz and the Wi-Fi standard and fixed wireless broadband in outdoor environments that perhaps we haven't seen up to this point because of the breadth of spectrum that's going to be available. And, and time will tell. Uh, we'll see the entrepreneurs and the inventors uh, come to the forefront. That's, that's fully true. Um, I do think at this point, we probably have all the answers we're going to have on the poll. What do we have? What's it look like? A lot of very important and uh, some I'm not uh, sure. So that makes that somewhat important. Any surprises here for you, Scott? Uh, no, I, I think that that's, that's a, a reasonable response, actually. I, I think in some cases, uh, six gigahertz won't have a play. Uh, for a particular uh, environment or network, uh, and in others where they've exhausted the available spectrum based on their user density, uh, they're you know salivating to, to get more spectrum and put it to use. Okay, so we do have questions coming into the chat, so I'm going to go back to that. Um, uh, one of the questions is, can you speak briefly to Cambian's current and projected status with government compliance? Specifically, what tiers of Cambion's product lines are currently CMMC-3 and FIPS compliant? And what is the roadmap in this area? So we do not have a FIPS compliant radio uh, available today, uh, FIPS 140-2 or FIPS 140-3 uh, for that matter. However, uh, that is a specific space that we are actively looking at. Uh, and contemplating uh, near-term development against. Uh, I hope we were able to capture contact information because I'd love to follow up with that individual offline and uh, chat a little bit further about what we're doing uh, and, and perhaps explore broader requirements for the market application. Uh, that, that, th those are two, uh, two important attributes, but not the only attributes to likely meet the market that they're, they're working within. Great, okay, perfect. Hopefully you two will be able to connect uh, at a later time. Um, so obviously, this is the question, obviously EPMP will require new hardware, but will the 450 meter and 450B be software upgradable to six gigahertz? Unfortunately, no, the, the 450 will also need new hardware. Uh, and we are working hard uh, to support both five gig and six gig in the 450 platform, uh, but it will be new hardware for the 450 as well. Okay. Uh, there was a question about the uh, new uh, CMM6 next generation platform. Uh, when's that going to be available? That was asked earlier to a tool, but for those that might not have heard that answer, maybe Scott, you can um, give them some. I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat the question? When is the new CMM6 next generation platform going to be available? Ah, so the follow on to the CMM5. Yep. Okay. So uh, we've actually been working on, and I, I think what they're referring to is the TX uh, series. And we're anticipating uh, public announcement here in, in the near term. Uh, so I, I, I don't want to get in front of, I was not able to attend that earlier session, so I don't want to get in front of the boss uh, on that. Uh, but, but it is imminent uh, on our announcement of that platform. Now, he may have been more explicit, and he's the boss, so he can do that. <laughs> no worries. I, I, I like that answer. So, um, you know, there, there's a, and please, if you have any other questions, um, put it in. Um, what is the best information source to track progress on six gigahertz info? I, I would suggest if, you, if they're not already engaged uh, to get onto our uh, Cambium community, and you'll see regular posts as we progress forward on the Cambium community. And, and you can narrow your interest specifically to fixed wireless broadband uh, or the Wi-Fi portfolio there. That would, in my, my recommendation, that'd be the best place. And, and Cambium will, will be publishing periodic updates. We'll have periodic webinars, et cetera. But for day-to-day -day engagement or asking questions and engaging with our product line managers and our development teams, uh, the community is really the best place to, to park yourself. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so another question is, what have been the real world, uh, real world field experiences of using software defined radios in similar situations? Well, right now, XV3 uh, and the transition uh, to, to uh, Wi-Fi 6, the ability to configure those radios uh, based on uh, band and standard uh, is in place today. And we find uh, network operators taking advantage of that 
to optimize performance based on their, uh, cust their customer base, the, the clients that they're seeing accessing the network. So it, 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 the, the software defined radio, huge advantage, uh, directly influences the performance of the network and, and is being taken advantage of today. Perfect. Well, thank you, Scott. Um, this has been great. Thanks for the Q&A. Thanks to the audience for submitting it. I want to remind everybody to join us at 50 past the hour for our next presentation with Rahul Patel. He's the SVP and GM of Qualcomm on advances in wireless networking technology. Uh, before we get to that, um, I would like you to enjoy this short video from Cambium, but remember that the link to Rahul's presentation at 50 past the hour is below. So back to Cambium for the video. Thanks, Scott. Thank you and uh, thank the audience for your time and attention. Very much appreciate it. Uh, my name is Roy Alexander. I am the business development manager for VisionNet Incorporated based out of Great Falls, Montana. We got into the, the managed Wi-Fi network space um, as a ask from one of our clients. The, the bottleneck, which are inherent in, in any network deployment, is no longer the wireless side. We had deployments of, of uh, uh, a mixed bag of different wireless equipment and different network equipment and things like that. Uh, I thought it was important to, to simplify that, unify it into one platform uh, in, in a very important aspect of that platform is central management from a, uh, from a location. For us, it's the knock here in Great Falls, Montana. And, and so we went out and we looked at a number of vendors uh, and landed on Cambium for a couple of reasons. Um, one, the performance, two, the price point, and three, the, the corporate support behind it. It allows our techs to interact with those networks from a remote basis, allows our techs to react to alarms coming out of that. So the business results from that, of course, increase revenue. Uh, and, and noticeably increased customer satisfaction. Saves time, saves money, saves effort.